What's going on, guys? Welcome back to Project Freelance. If you have never heard my voice, my name is Kay Anagonio, and I am your host here on this podcast. I'm here to talk to you about freelancing. We're going to be talking about freelancing as a musician and as a screen printer this week. My guest is Michael Skaggs, otherwise known as Skaggs. This guy, I've known him for a couple years, and I've known his band since 2012. You know, he spent a lot of time in Oklahoma. I'm from Oklahoma. We have a lot in common in that way, you know. So we're going to be talking about touring. We're going to be talking about making music in the studio, label issues, all kinds of stuff when it comes to music. So I hope you guys stick around for this episode. But before we get started, I got to let you know that I have a book out called No Tracers, An Urban Explorer's Diary. When I'm not freelancing, I actually explore abandoned buildings all over the world, take photos of them, and make videos about them. So if you guys want to support my art, you can pick up a copy at justtheletterk.com slash no tracers. Or if you want to further support the podcast, head over to the Patreon, patreon.com slash justtheletterk, and you can support my work over there. Thank you guys for listening to Project Freelance. If you are new to the podcast, hit that subscribe button so that you are notified every week whenever a new episode goes live. But just for your reference, it is every Monday morning at 7 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, just in time for your morning commute to work on a Monday. Hopefully this podcast helps get your week started on a positive note. So without further ado, I would like to have my guest introduce himself. Skaggs, can you please introduce yourself and what it is you do to the audience? What's up? Uh, Michael Skaggs. I'm a uh, screen printer by trade and a musician. So let's talk about music first. Tell me how you got into music, into live music. I went to this kind of small elementary junior high uh, in Oklahoma, and they're like one of the only uh, elementary schools that has a band program that's mandatory for sixth graders. So, like, every single sixth grader has to do one year of band. And um, to save a long story, I I got in this crazy accident when I was a kid, and my uh, lips and face were, like, basically sewn back together. So I had a doctor's note that basically said that I had to play percussion because I couldn't use a wind instrument with my lips. (laughs) And... um, Yeah, so that I kind of started out and I got really passionate, like really early. And uh, by like seventh, eighth grade, the the high school band was like kind of poaching me to fill in for like, you know, there was a really small band program. So they're having me fill in for, you know, like high school football nights and um, basketball games and stuff like that. And um, that kind of led into me networking with other people in high school and somewhere along the the line I started a rock band with some friends and it really sucked but (laughs) it was like my first band and we uh that kind of got me started and um I was I I played in a bunch of like little crappy local bands over the years but I was always the one in all of my groups that was like the really dedicated the guy that set up the practices the guy that booked all the shows like i was the guy that did all the behind the scenes work and um uh i guess ultimately that that led me to meeting the guys in outline color because they had all kind of been in similar situations to me they had all played in a bunch of local bands and they were the more serious people in their local bands and we kind of united and became a force together just kind of based on wanting to do more than just play the same local festivals and the same local shows and support the same bands. And I guess that's, that's kind of what brought me into music. So first of all, what school did you go to in Oklahoma? Um, through elementary or I guess through junior high, I went to Berry Hill and then, uh, I, I transferred in high school to like a much larger school, uh, called Charles page. It was like, a I want to say there's like six or 800 people in my graduating class. Damn, dude. Yeah, I uh, grew up going to Deer Creek, if you know that, in Edmond. No shit. Yeah, dude. That's, oh, that's where so I grew crazy. up. <laughs> oh, man, that's so wild. I was in Edmond, like, last week. Wow. It's a small world, man. Well, it's how, crazy. How, how have we never talked about that before? <laughs> I have no idea. But, yeah, I'm, I'm from Oklahoma City originally. Uh, that's my, my hometown. But I very rarely go back there because there's there's nothing there. <laughs> You know, 
I, I just came back to Oklahoma like six months ago after living in Denver for like five years and Vegas for like about a year. And uh, there's still not that much, especially compared to like LA or, you know, whatever, but it has come a long way and there I'm actually starting to see the potential here now. Wow. That's amazing. So my family actually has a, a storage unit from when I was like 16, we moved overseas and we put a storage, we put all our shit in a storage unit in Oklahoma city and it's still sitting there almost 10 years later. Oh my God. So my dad's wow. like, my dad's like grinding my gears. He's like, we have to get back there. We have to empty the storage unit out. So I might be back soon. So hopefully, uh, we can uh, catch up in person sooner rather than later. <laughs> totally. If you need help, you you know, we obviously have a trailer and stuff. We oh, hell yeah. For sure. For sure. So um, let's just go into Outline and Color stuff. So tell me about the formation of that band. Tell me about p- playing your first show with them and what that was like for you. Okay. Um, well, like I said, I-, I had known a couple of the guys through uh, – like other bands that we had like played mutual shows together with just in separate bands. And, um, CJ and Forrest were in this band called Vera Medea. And, um, they had been around pretty much as long as I had been doing stuff. And they just like made this MySpace page at the time called FMS. (laughs) It was just like for, it was just like an acronym. Um, they didn't have a band name. They, they had just made a couple demos together. And at the time, like we were, where they were really like biting at the like "eat me while I'm hot," like super early attack, attack, like kind of wave of of post hardcore. And um, I just like found I was all over MySpace, and I just found that page through I don't even it was maybe it was a bulletin or I don't even fucking remember. It was like literally twelve years ago, but uh, I just reached out to them and. I was like, yo, do you guys have a drummer? Because at the time I was like mostly known for, for drumming around Tulsa. And uh, they were like, well, we actually have a drummer, but we need somebody to, to do vocals. And um, I was just like, sweet, I do vocals. Uh, my friend Ryan Harvey, he's got a studio. I'll go up to his place and and uh, I'll track some stuff for a song and, and you know, we'll see if, if you guys dig it. And uh, so I, I set up this... Uh, recording session and and i went to ryan harvey's place and i tracked on this song and uh at the time i was like more of a a screamer than a singer and they were looking for somebody that could do both or at like like simultaneously or not simultaneously but like a maddie mullins kind of thing you know like be able to be versatile and i wasn't i it was a long time ago and i wasn't just i just wasn't like quite that developed so they were like you know um we really like you, you know, we've seen you around in other bands and, you know, we know you work hard. We'd like to find something for you to do in this band. So like, you know, we don't know what yet, but we want you to be in the band. So I was like, for sure. I just want to be a part of something bigger than what I'm doing. So like I'm down to do whatever. So that kind of started me playing uh, keyboards and uh, <laughs> we, uh, we kind of started the band and we found Trevor and uh, we found Jonathan and we, we kind of moved away from the whole like single vocalist thing because Jonathan and Trevor were so good at what they did like individually. We were like, well, you know, this is the exception. We'll have two vocalists because fuck it. And um, we, we started like, you know, writing songs and playing more shows or, uh, you know, just like our first few local shows. And, and that kind of got us to the point where, um, you know, a couple management people in LA reached out to us and were like, Hey, you know, what are you guys doing? You know, we kind of dig what you're doing. We'd like to bring you out to LA and have you showcase for some labels and see what happens. And, uh, anyway, we, we went out and we showcased for like (laughs) Sumerian and Epitaph and the Pantheon agency and all of these massive companies that we had no business showcasing for. <laughs> we, uh, we had only played a couple shows and we didn't even have, like, we didn't know how to look like a band. I think we showed up in like gym shorts and like <laughs> tom- toms or some shit. Like, we're like, we're like, it's not a show. We don't need to like dress up like for a show. Like it's a showcase. We're just playing music for these people. And like pretty much everybody passed on us and was like, said that it was because of our image. And one of their major hangups was that I was playing keyboards and that we didn't have a bass player. 
and they were they were literally like yo is your bass player sick and we're like nah we just uh decided to backtrack the bass instead of the keyboards and they were like yeah no don't do that (laughs) so i was like all right cool so i mean i i I was fairly versatile like i I played a bunch of instruments growing up and the guys were like well you down to play bass (laughs) i was like sure (laughs) why not so I, i picked up bass and you know that, that that kind of brought us to like our the beginning of our touring career, I guess. So you're for the most part on bass, you're self taught and keyboards, I assume as well, right? Yeah, yeah. So how did you learn how to play the, all these instruments? Like, did you watch YouTube videos? Where did you learn from other people? How did you figure this stuff out? Well, um, when I was really young, my dad bought me a guitar, and I had like strummed around a little bit on it growing up and um i learned how to read music in in band so it it was just uh i mean once you know like what the strings are and how each fret is just like you know a half step up from the the previous one it was just kind of like math at that point um it definitely there was like definitely a learning curve and it wasn't even until like i don't know the last few years i would say that i was even like relatively good at playing bass (laughs) but it wasn't it wasn't necessarily like ever even something that i was like super passionate about i was passionate about being in a group and like being in a band and being playing music with other people and being a part of something bigger than myself i I was never like i want to be the best bass player in the world you know it was just like i want to be the best bass player for outlining color Mm. no that's great and i totally understand wanting to be a part of something and I think a lot of the listeners out there can relate to that as well. So when when you guys started touring, tell me about the lifestyle change from being at home playing local shows to now you're on the road and you're doing different venues every single night. <laughs> um, humbling uh, to start because <laughs> uh, we were we worked really hard in Tulsa to to establish ourselves um, in the the initial part of our. Uh, you know band days i guess like when we first started out um we had all been in joke bands we had all been in bands that we were embarrassed to be in before and we wanted this to be different so i mean we 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 got a practice place and we we were sweating it out in a like a storage unit with no ac in the summer doing like you know several four hour practices a week like just trying to get really tight on the the material that we had just like written and uh we didn't release any material until we were tight at playing it and we didn't play any shows until we were ready to play. So, um, you know, when we, the first show we played was, you know, it wasn't like packed out, but there were a couple hundred people there. And uh, most of the shows that we played in Tulsa were that way until we started touring. And then it was like, oh, welcome to 10 people a night. <laughs> or like, you know, re- relying on the locals to to really like, you know, do pre-sale and stuff for there to even be a draw for, because we realized really quickly, like the hype that we established was very local. (laughs) And, um, you know, it, it, it took a lot of grinding before we were even getting, you know, 50 to a hundred people at a show relatively consistently. And sometimes it's, you know, sometimes we're still lucky to do that. It just kind of depends on the the climate and, you know, the time of year and just the day of the week and tell, you know, a million different circumstances. Yeah. So I assume you guys started out in a van. Um, tell me about living life in a van with a more than more than the normal amount of band members. Um, Cause you, I mean, you had two <laughs> vocalists. So what was that like to cram you guys all in there? Oh man. Well, our first van was like a, a Chevy 1500 work van. <laughs> so it was like, uh, <laughs> it was, <laughs> there were no seats in the back of it. It even had like one of those like lockable gates, like where you could like legitimately lock people into the back of it. It was like (laughs) a cage. It was pretty fucked. Um, There was no AC in the back of it. Um, We built this like really shitty bunk, but it didn't really work very well. Most of us preferred to just like sleep on the floor. But it was literally like you open the back door and there's like nothing in the van. It was just like like a bunch of pallets on the floor and us like jigsawed together. Um, like a, a little bit later into our career, we, we put out like a self titled album, like right when we started like getting a little bit of traction and it, it afforded us enough money to get a little bit nicer van. 
but even still we bought like a sprinter because we were thinking like mechanical and like uh like towing capabilities and you know all that shit but again we bought another work van (laughs) (laughs) so and this one actually had like a, a legitimate partition between the front and the back so like you, if you were in the front, you couldn't even talk to the people in the back. It was like being a limo driver, only the window didn't roll down. <laughs> so, like, the first tour we do in this, it's, like, in the fucking middle of the winter. And we didn't even have a heater in the back of it. Like, we were so fucking stupid. It's like, oh, my God, it was so bad. We Ultimately, we finally, like, built bunks in it. And we put, like, a an RV AC on the back of it. But, like, even in the peak of us like really just like having the best vehicle we ever had it was that vehicle bunks an ac and then this like super ghetto rigged generator that was like at one point in front of the vehicle and at one point inside the trailer like just with the exhaust vented out but we would legit run the generator pretty much 24 7 which which i'm talking like we had like a welded frame onto the front of the sprinter <laughs> that's the jet and it, and it was just like the same kind of generator that you would use to like power your house in a storm but just welded to the front of a vehicle so we'd like especially in LA and shit like we pull up to a stoplight or something and we got this like 100 decibel 80 decibel <laughs> generator just like it was like we we had people that we stay with be like that like were you know like wise to like you know small engine mechanics and stuff and they were like you know you guys are literally driving a bomb in front of you right (laughs) they're like if you run into anything that's gonna explode (laughs) and we're just like yeah well that's that's what we're working with yeah we need we need ac we need heat we need power what are we gonna do (laughs) gotta just jerry rig this shit it was literally like that at times. I mean, like when it's like a hundred, hundred ten plus, like, and the options are like maybe the generator explodes or or we have cold air. Like we're gonna choose the cold air, unfortunately. One hundred percent. I remember my first tour. The van didn't have a heat shield on the floor, so we oh were, my god, our feet were burning up. We had holes in our socks. We cooked a bowl of ramen in the fucking like the metal parts of the seat. Oh my god, it was insane holy shit yeah dude. that's insane tour life right <laughs> oh yeah i've heard so many crazy stories too like i feel like we have crazy stories but like every time i'm on tour and i start talking to other bands i'm like holy fuck like some band told me the story that about just to cut it short like they were driving through the mountains and their brakes went out and and they had to like edge the guardrail like through the mountains to like get the vehicle to stop and they said that they had several like up, down, up, down like excursions before they finally got it to stop. Wow! Oh my god! Like they would, they they creep to the top of a hill and they they'd think that they had it stopped and then it would just like crest to the top of it and go down <laughs> another one like a roller coaster. It's like fuck, man! I thought we had it bad. Oh my god! So let's talk a little bit about the mental health side of touring. Um, have you ever dealt with any like mental health kind of issues while on tour? I know it can be a very lonely place out there on the road. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, like every band starting out is really excited to go on tour, and you know we were we were no exception. Like we we still like get super excited to tour, but like. Now that we're older, we, we kind of look at it a little bit differently. Um, um, it It's kind of hard to just like get into, but like, because I, I'm always, I've even like publicly spoken about it before where like, I, I really don't like to speak about the negative side of touring so much because I really feel incredibly blessed that I get to tour at all. And I know that there's like tons and tons of bands and artists that would would like saw off their toes like for the opportunity to do one tour and and I've been super fortunate to travel the whole world and and get to do uh tons of touring but it is super lonely and um I'm I'm kind of like an introverted person and when I'm on the road like I'm the opposite of that I'm like putting myself out there on stage every night and talking to you know 
10 to a hundred people a day that I've never met before. Or, um, it, it, it's just like, it's a lot. It's, 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 a, it's taxing for my, my personality type. There's a lot of people that just like, they thrive in those conditions and I'm just not really one of them. Um, I've learned to make it work because that's like kind of part of the game. And I feel like, uh, like I said, I'm super, I'm super fortunate to get to do what I do and all of the people that come out and support me, like I feel indebted to them. So I feel like that's part of the trade-off, you know? Um, I, I have to make myself a little bit uncomfortable sometimes to, um, to be fair, you know, like that, the, the, those people come, you know, expecting a certain thing when they go to see a show. And I, I feel like, uh, it's my job and the rest of my guys job to provide that. Absolutely. Um, but you know, I've been super depressed on tour and, and that has like, uh, it makes everything suck on tour. It's like, it makes it to where like the only possible way you could possibly have a good day is, is if the show is perfect. And, and if the show isn't perfect and you're depressed and you're having a terrible day, it can like wreck you even further. And, um, yeah, that, that really sucks. <laughs> I've definitely been there a bunch of times being sick on tour is, is like so much worse than being sick at home. Um, yeah, I've definitely dealt with like anxiety. Um, I, I dealt with a couple tours where I had such bad anxiety that I, I developed stomach ulcers and, uh, I had to like take crazy medication every day to coat my stomach, just to eat, like just drinking water would burn myself. I would like burn my stomach. Like I, I was having constant, um, uh, just constant episodes of just being just relentlessly sick to my stomach and, and not being able to do anything about it. <laughs> uh, you know, like not having health insurance on the road. And I feel like I'm rambling at this point, but there's a lot of shit about tour that sucks. <laughs> no, uh, it's, it's really... great. I mean, podcasts are for rambling, if you will. <laughs> sure. I mean, it, it's just, uh, I love, I love touring. I love performing. I love all of that stuff. I love meeting new people. I love meeting people that are passionate about the, the art that I'm a part of. Um, and it's just like, there's just, there's a double edge with every good thing in life. And, and, and that's it. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. And I was recently talking to my, my manager for my music stuff and he actually wants to get health insurance for his artists. So that's like his goal for 2020 is to, you know, support his artists in a, in a more, comprehensive way where they can actually like get help when they need it because like you said most touring musicians don't have health insurance and we do get sick on tour we do deal with these things on tour and you know uh things like car wrecks are frequent so it's it's super hard to be in a touring project whether as a uh an artist or as a crew member so yeah i i just I don't think people realize that there are so many difficulties when it comes to touring. Like everyone thinks it's this beautiful, glamorous thing, but no, it's, it's a grind. It's definitely a grind and you have to be built for it and not everyone is built for it. Um, so I, I agree. let's talk about, um, working on studio albums, talk about what it was like to, you know, grow the sound of outline and color and, uh, to grow the, the brand and the name. Sure. Um, well, we, we've we kind of had a multitude of different experiences. Like we're, we're literally, uh, we're going into tracking our fifth studio album next month. So we've kind of got to experience all different kinds of situations, I guess. Um, you know, our first album, well, our first EP that we did in like 2009, 2008, we... Uh, we just tracked it in a, a trailer home in Cleveland, Oklahoma, <laughs> in the middle of nowhere. Um, we had like a super shitty interface and like, um, I think we borrowed a microphone or we had like a $300 mic, which was like more expensive than the whole setup we had that we were recording on. And um, we, we tracked everything. And then we, I think we borrowed some monitors and, and CJ, our, our guitar player that kind of has, has been our like producer throughout the years. He uh, went to somebody else's place and mixed on some monitors and we got it to where we thought it was good. And um, 
I think we, we paid like $300 at the time to have Joey Sturgis master it. Wow. Only $300 um, to have Joey Sturgis master it? Do you know how crazy that is? Oh, I know. And we, it was like, it was so long ago, like we had to mail him a disc. <laughs> <laughs> um, asking Alexandria was recording their first record with him uh, when when he mastered it. It was, it was pretty crazy. Um, so we... So we went from that to uh, our second album. We uh, we tracked everything ourselves. We one of our friends, Ryan Harvey, who I mentioned earlier, uh, he had a, a pretty solid home studio. So we we tracked the drums and vocals out of his studio, and then just kind of DI'd the guitars uh, on our own time. And we had uh, Andrew Wade uh, mix and master it, but it was still like you know us kind of producing on our own. And then sending out for you know mixer master um our second album was kind of a a shitty situation we had just signed to standby records and you know but prior to our signing we had we had deposits paid and plans to record with with drew folk and uh, as soon as we signed the label like was like oh yeah you're not doing that you have to tour before we're gonna give you anything to do an album so we're like, all right, fuck you guys, we'll do it. So we toured like so fucking much, like so much. And we're on our like last tour of the year, like a few more dates till we get home and we get an email from the, the label and it's just like, so what's up with your record? Uh, we need you to turn it in within like 30 days. And like at this point, they hadn't cut any deposits. We hadn't like... We had pretty much given up our deposit to Drew Folk because we had already booked studio time, and they were like, "Nah, that's not gonna work for us. You guys can record later." So we we only had like a few songs written because we had been touring so much. So we basically had to like come together and make that album happen in a month, which ultimately came down to like the mixing, mastering, and vocal tracking process happening in like a week. Uh, it, it was hell, and like the label was threatening to to shelve us if we didn't turn the album in on time, and that we would never release music again. And it was so fucked. <laughs> so we we made it happen, but like that album is like, you know, there's a lot of people that that love that album, and they're they you know they 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 hear music lit differently than us, you know. But we know that like, given you know the right amount of time and the right circumstances, that we would have done a much better job or done those songs better justice than, than we were able to do in the time that we had. So that was kind of like a complete polar opposite to the first two albums where we took our, or or the first two releases rather, where we we got to take our time and do things the way we wanted to do them and put them out on our schedule. And that was also our first experience with a a label. So it it was kind of just like a kick in the nuts right right from the get go. But the second time around, we had to do an option record for standby and we uh, we had picked up Mike Milford from the Artery Foundation at the time, and uh, he kind of like the label wanted to do bigger things than they were doing. You know, like they they don't have a lot, or at the time they didn't have a lot of artists that were were doing anything. And Mike Milford was kind of a name in the, the industry. So that when we did our second album, they kind of I don't want to say that they played ball because <laughs> they were still fucking terrible to work with, but they did uh they did pay for us to work with the actual producer and you know we we got to more or less do things on struggle our third album the way that we wanted to do them um but after after that whole label experience for our 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 most recent record we we just decided to, to go back to what we were comfortable with and produce within ourselves yeah, so I mean, what a learning experience that must have been for you guys. You know, you're excited to get on a label and get the backing from a label, and then all of a sudden they're threatening to shelve you. I mean, what was that like as as an artist to you know hear something like that from a from a label that you had trust in? Well, it was on my birthday, so that was super. Cool. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, literally on my birthday, it was like a Friday, and they're like, if you don't have the record physically turned in to victory records because that they did their distribution <laughs> by, by, uh, by Monday at noon, you guys are shelved for forever. 
so like i mean i remember like our our good cj our producer he uh he took adderall for the first time in his life ever <laughs> and uh he he stayed up for like three days <laughs> and, and like it came down to me and our other guitar player at like a fucking grocery store uploading the waves on like a, a grocery store internet connection like a fucking like star starbucks or something inside a grocery store and then like a just a w- fortunate of us to have like a dedicated fan in chicago like we emailed him the files he burned them to a disc and he hand delivered the masters to, no <laughs> to way. the label yeah and uh we made it like literally with like i don't know 15 minutes to spare or something like that it was it was it was not cool wow that's absolutely insane thinking back that was probably the start of my stomach ulcers (laughs) that sucks so much man (laughs) i can't believe you had a fan hand deliver the disc that's crazy to me and he's become like one of our best friends like since like uh cj cj is like like we're all friends with this guy but like cj it's like his best friend like every time we're in chicago we stay with him he's like the homie amazing man Uh, and it just goes to show how you know fans can really help build a band's career i mean with even little things like that hand delivering a cd that's uh that can be huge and and monumental for fans so it's super cool that he did that for you guys um yeah we might not be a band if he didn't (laughs) absolutely yeah that's so true um, so let's talk about you becoming frontman for for the band. How did that come about? <laughs> oh man. Um, well, I don't know. I first of all, like Trevor is uh, like he is. He will always be family to me, um, and I don't have any ill will or bad feelings towards him, and neither does anybody else in the band. But um, He's just, he's always had his, his vices that he struggled with. And, um, you know, for the last few years, he's been doing really, really good. And, um, I was more or less his, his, uh, sobriety sponsor for a couple of years. He lived with me for a long time. Um, we were really, really, really close until, you know, just like six months ago or so. And, um, I don't know. He just, uh, he found a girl that he was really, uh, really tight with and and uh, things just kind of changed for him and you know that combined with with him dealing with his own personal struggles uh, I think like the the financial end of of holding down you know a place to live and and a lifestyle and um, you know trying to start a family and um, all that stuff just kind of became too much for Trevor I think and um, he kind of just he hit us up before our last tour and was just like hey you know i'm dealing with a lot right now and i just i can't make this tour work and and uh we were kind of like put in this situation because we've we've canceled tours before we've we've canceled shows before and you know we're kind of getting to the point in our lives where this is this is more like i don't want to say make or break but you know the older we get the more we can't like <laughs> be children, you know, like we, yeah, we have yeah. to be serious. If, if we're going to continue to justify, um, you know, doing, putting time and love and energy into a project that doesn't necessarily pay all of our bills. Um, you know, we, we gotta be, we gotta be giving it like the college try and, and doing it seriously and for real. So we just kind of sat down internally and we we're just like, well, you know, what do we do here? We got this tour in one week and, uh, you know, our vocalist just kind of just told us that he's, he's not going to be able to do it. So, you know, we just sat down and we contemplated having fill in vocalists. We, we talked about a bunch of stuff, but ultimately we decided that it would be easier for John, our vocalist, our singer, um, to be able to pick up bass because in previous bands that he's played and he's been like a, guitarist and singer so it 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 was very it was very difficult don't get me wrong like i mean he's a great guitar player but very very challenging for him to pull off with with like a lot of the vocal runs and things that that he's kind of known for doing um 
and for me to just step up into to Trevor's role because um, I've always done Trevor's backups, um, and I, I know you know all of our songs by heart. Uh, so it was just like you know with with having only a week to prepare, we just kind of decided that that was the best option because if we were going to fly somebody in to work with us you know we would have to have them learn all the lyrics and learn all the songs and we just kind of just decided that it would be easier for us to accomplish being that we already know the songs in some capacity so um you know we we practiced really fucking hard for a week and stressed the fuck out and we got on tour just the four of us me cj austin and john and um it went way better than we expected it to. Um, and not, not just like on stage, but the offstage dynamic, it was just like, I don't know if it was a, a numbers thing or a personality thing, or just that we were all bonding together because we were kind of put in this shitty situation together. But it, it was just, it was almost effortless and we were all having a great time. And then we kind of got into some shows where we were playing with Slaves and Picturesque and Macari and a couple other bands that you know we had we had toured with or played shows with in the past, and uh, you know they kind of knew what was going on and we we'd given them the story and stuff and we uh, we started performing with them and they they started pulling us aside after the shows and they'd be like, hey, you know, we fucking love Trevor. Trevor's like the nicest, funniest, like great energy person that we've ever met but like this thing you guys got going right now is like is undeniable like so this something is something is really cool about what's going on and i think you guys should like you know no offense to trevor at all hope the best for him but we think you guys should keep keep exploring this avenue so we we're like yeah yeah whatever we'll see what happens when we get home and uh we just kind of kept touring and we got into a, a stint of the tour where we had a couple of days off and we were, we were kind of faced with driving a really, really long distance to play this, the show up East, or if we kind of chilled where we were at, like it would save us some money and save us a lot of driving. So we kind of opted to cancel this, the show. And, uh, we went to Cleveland and, uh, stayed with our friend, Andrew Bayless, who plays like for nine shrines and used to be in life on repeat and, We'd known him since like the the super early days, and uh, he was just like, "Man, I don't got anything going on. If you guys want to write with me, I'll fucking write with you for a hundred bucks a day, which is absolutely insane. Like, like we we would have paid more than that for a hotel, and we could stay with him. So we were like, "Hell yeah, let's fuck around. Maybe we'll make something cool." And just to sum it up, like we made the most collaborative like piece of music that we had ever made as a band. Um, Everybody was stoked about it. It was like kind of a new direction that we were excited about, but still resonates with like our, our old works. And we just kind of decided immediately that we wanted to do more songs. And um, we, we just kind of started figuring out how we were going to do it financially. And that, that kind of led us to right now. I mean, we're, we're hitting the studio in two weeks to do our, our fifth studio album. Wow. And what's that like? Like, what are you going to be doing a majority of the vocals, I assume, on the new album? Um, I wouldn't say the majority because me and John really want right. to keep it 50 50. Um, you know, John is like an absolutely incredible vocalist. And um, he is, he's like such a, a team player. And, uh, you know, a part of him, like, I know, like, at one point in time, it was a dream for him to like play an instrument and sing in a band. But, as he got older, it was also a dream for him to be like the front person of a band. And now that, now that we're, we're doing the, uh, the single front man thing, you know, he's definitely kind of taken a, uh, I don't want, I don't want to make it sound like it's worse than it is, but like, you know, he used to be the, the guy in, in front with Trevor and now he's playing bass and singing. And, uh, I don't think there's anything less than that. In fact, me personally coming from, playing bass for so many years like i truly appreciate how difficult it is to do what he's doing and i personally could not do it so it's even cooler to me but at the same time like um i know that john has really like taken one for the team by playing bass so 
it, it's my my goal to make sure that the the whole 50 50 aspect of the vocals is is maintained because i really want him to feel like he has you know as, as, is as much as the front man as i am even though he's playing bass gotcha totally i totally understand that uh, so let's switch gears and talk about your screen printing business sure so uh how when did that come into play why did you pick that up um really it, it came into play very early in with outlining color um a lot of the other bands that I had played in like locally never really even made it to the point where, you know, maybe we'd have a t-shirt or something, but we never had the point where we needed like a whole merch table or anything like that. And, um, once outline started playing shows, we, we kind of realized like we, you know, we support like Memphis Mayfire, like the color morale on a local show or something. And we'd see that they'd have like a whole table set up and we were like, we need that. (laughs) So, um, we, we worked with a couple screen printing companies like AKT and like those local company we worked with. And, um, you know, we kind of got screwed over by some companies, got overcharged by some companies. And I, it was just too hard to get merch. Like it, it was, it was, it was, a, it was just too much of a thing. And it, it wasn't something, at least at that point in time, that you could just like Google and be like, where do I get merch for bands? It, you know, it was like one 800 inktees.com or like you know one of those google advertising places that charges you like 15 bucks for a a one color shirt or something like that so um i had uh been saving some money for a while and i had a friend that i grew up with that was in one of my earlier bands and him and his brothers they were going like out of town to this screen shop that they got a good deal on shirts and they were taking their designs and then just going to events and trying to just sling them to people and they were doing pretty good with it. And so it kind of got my, me thinking like, you know, that's ridiculous that they have to drive three hours to go pick up their shirts every week when they do this thing, but they're doing it because they're getting the best deal. So I was like, this is fucked up. So I started looking into what it took to make t-shirts and, I ended up finding Ryanet, which is like one of the the bigger screen printing supply companies in the country. And uh, I got to talk to the owner of the company. If, and if you if you search like screen printing, like whatever on Google, chances are there's a Ryanet video about it. And there's this guy that's missing a thumb. And like he, he tells you everything about screen printing. They have like hundreds of videos. Like he is like the number one screen printing tutorial guy. And I got on the phone. I was just like, yo, I'm in this band and like, blah, blah, blah. blah. We want to print T-shirts. But like, I want to be able to print T-shirts for my friends, too. And he was like, I was in a band. And that's why I started this company. He's like, we have a. a, Yeah. And he's like, we we have a, a, a warehouse in Arkansas, which is like three hours away. And he was like, we do this class. Come out, bring a couple of your bandmates. And uh, we'll teach you everything there is to know in like two days or three days or something. And if you want to buy a setup, like while you're there too, we can set that up and we'll give you like promotional pricing or something. So like me and two of the band guys, like we went out to Arkansas and we, we did this seminar for like three days and I ended up like purchasing a press and man, it took me so long to get even halfway good at it. But ultimately like I, I was able to start printing merch for us and then for, you know, other bands, people in school, like clothing lines, all sorts of stuff. And uh, I mean, I still do it to this day. Like it's kind of the glue that holds my entire life together financially. You know, I I have my hands in a lot of different little things, but it's been the most consistent for man, 10 years now. Man, it's, it's so good to hear that it's been a consistent thing for you as a freelancer. It can be very hard to find something like that. So it's, it's really cool to hear that screen printing has been your thing that, like you said, holds your, your life together financially. Um, so what is something, you know, now that you wish you knew when you started? Oh man. Um, I wish I knew when I start, like I've always been somebody that gets really excited about things. Like if I have an idea or some sort of plan or some vision, like I I just like, that's all I can focus on. And I just want to put it together and anything that I can do 
to get me closer to putting it together or whatever it may be a band uh, uh, a screen printing project a uh, marketing project like whatever it's just like all I can focus on and when I was younger I had a tendency to just like talk 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 or send like really lengthy emails or if I couldn't get to somebody on the phone like right then I would send them like an excessively long text message or, or something like that, you know? And I wish that I would have known back then that those kinds of like things kind of give the opposite impression that you're, you're trying to go for most of the time. Um, uh, uh, less is more, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Like if, if you're really excited about something, like it's best to like, maintain your excitement and convey that excitement through preparation like if you're trying to give a like a presentation or something you know instead of just being like i'm so excited about this project and ah, i want to show you how excited i am check this out like if you take that excitement and you channel that into you know doing your homework um being prepared having like all your ducks in a row that that just reads so much better in almost any situation especially 100%. business definitely so if people want to find you or your band or your screen printing company uh, how do they do that where can they go and how can they get in touch with you for sure i feel like every time i've done a uh, uh podcast regarding uh my entrepreneurial uh exploits i'm always in between websites but um, you can find me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Skags, S-K, the number four, G-G-S. And uh, you can find my band, Outline in Color, Outline in Color, one word, uh, on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all that stuff. It's all the same URL. So that was Michael Skaggs. If you guys have not heard of Outline and Color, please go check them out. They're an absolutely amazing band. They have this song called Paradise is Burning. And oh my God, it just, it gets to me. It gets to me every time I hear it. And then if you go back to uh, the Jury of Wolves album, that one, uh, that one's a favorite of mine. Absolutely. That, that album got me into the band actually. And so I definitely highly recommend that album. It came out in 2012. So I've been a fan of Outline and Color for quite a few years now. And uh, I love watching them grow. I watch it. I love watching their music progress. And they, they are absolutely a phenomenal band. And you should check them out. Their music is on Spotify, iTunes, everywhere music is available. So be sure to pick it up. If you guys enjoyed this episode of Project Freelance, please do me a huge favor and leave a rating. I'm actually going to be giving away a shirt if you guys want a shirt. If you want a chance at winning a shirt, all you got to do is leave a rating and some feedback on this podcast and then DM me at Project Freelance on Instagram and show me that you have left a review and I will be picking a winner or two or three people to get a shirt. So yeah, that helps the podcast grow when you guys leave feedback. Right now we're at a 4.5. Let's see if we can get it up to a 4.8. I would like to see some growth with this podcast this year. I would like some sponsors. So I'm working on that right now. So just know that the podcast is ever growing and we're always looking for new guests. So if you make $1,000 or more as a freelancer, I want to hear from you. Hit me up at contact at just the letter K.com and we will talk more about getting you on this show. I would love to have you. Thank you guys for listening to another week. I will talk to you next Monday at 7 a.m. Pacific Standard Time again with another guest and another episode. All right. Talk to you later. Stay strong, keep enduring, go out and go create something.